Last model we will now look at is DenseNet. And DenseNet has a similar idea of using residual connections as ResNet, but applies them in a different way. So in DenseNet, as you can see here below, we basically build up what we call dense blocks. And dense blocks are built up of a sequence of convolutions that take as input all the previous convolutions output. So we have here our input stack, apply one convolution, and the next convolution takes then the original stack plus the new output of the first convolution as input. And then the uh, third convolution takes in the original stack, the first convolution and the second convolution and so on. So this is how we basically stack all the um, channel features. We always use up front here a one by one convolution to reduce the feature uh, count so we don't explode the number of parameters but it basically applies then these residual connections in the way that we just stagger all of them, concatenate, and then apply the next convolution. Between these dense blocks, we will use then, for example, simple layers uh, that don't add too much to the gradient flow. Therefore, we still have an opportunity to use these residual connections, therefore a strong gradient flow. So when we start implementing it, we first focus on a dense layer and a dense, then we basically combine dense layers to a dense block. So a dense layer is basically here a single convolution, while the dense block is basically then the whole part, so the whole sequence of convolutions, and then we use the transition layer here to go between dense blocks. So let's first start with defining a dense layer, and dense layer is nothing else than first applying this one by one convolution. Um, which reduces then the number of features, while then with silver three is then our actual convolution. And the output is then concatenated instead of added in the ResNet. So this is quite a simple layer to do it. Um, one different notation here is that we define a growth rate and a bottleneck size instead of saying the output chance, for example. So the output chance per um, or per dense layer is then called also growth rate because we add these number of chains uh, per layer, while the bottleneck size is then to how many um, times the growth rate do we want to compress the features before pushing them through the figure three. This is just a different notation, which is usually used in dense layers. This is why we also use it here. The dense block then summarizes a couple of dense layers into one. Uh, block, well, as it's called. Uh, therefore, it's nothing too exciting. So as you can see, the first layer takes then C in, so the number of input channels in the next layer takes then C in plus once the growth rate, because this is the number of output channels per convolutions. And we do it just n times, because we want n layers. And then basically the output of the last layer is the concatenation of the input plus all the previous convolutions. And this is what we also use as output of a block. So this is why implementing it is quite straightforward. The transition layer um, is then the layer which we'll use between dense blocks. And this is usually also used to reduce the image dimensionality, so for the height and width. There are different ways of doing it. What we do here is that we use the average pooling um, as it's also just a good alternative to max pooling or so on. So let's also run it here. And then the dense net, you see it has a very similar idea or also notation than a rest net. So the num layers is basically a list of number or of number of layers per block. So we want four blocks each with six layers in it. Um, and in between all these layers is then always a transition layer. To reduce the dimensionality. Bottleneck size is 2, growth rate is 16, meaning each convolution will take as input 32 channels and output 16. We then create it here by always creating a dense block and if um, basically it is not the last block we apply a transition layer because it, we don't want to apply a transition layer to the very last block which takes um, which output is basically directly forwarded to the output net. So our output net is then also uh, here pushed through 
again our activation, uh, our mean pooling, and then predicts the classes. Here you see we actually apply again a batch normalization and activation function. This is because similar to the pre-activation where SNET, the dense layers here actually apply always the batch norm and the activation function before any convolution. This is, you see where they already use ideas actually from the pre-activation present. The initialization is again very similar uh, to the inception network and therefore we can just run it here and add it to our dictionary and finally train it. DenseNet compared to ResNet can actually be trained well with Adam and often it's also better to train with Adam than with SGD. This is again a different characteristic, so this is why we also use here Adam to train it. Again, we provide also a tensor board here. Um, I will not run it this time because it's really just showing the same thing. Um, there's nothing a big difference in the training curve compared to Inception. Um, it has a very similar structure, so if you're interested, take a closer look at it. Finally, so now we have implemented all our models, we can actually uh, put them into a table and compare them overall. So we have here now a table with a validation accuracy, test accuracy, number of parameters. So what we are mainly interested in is the test accuracy. The number of parameters is all similar. So you see that actually the ResNet has slightly the most number of parameters. However, this is not the explanation for why it actually outperforms the other two networks quite a lot. Um, DenseNet is actually also known, so DenseNet has here the least parameters, and it's actually also known to be more efficient in number of parameters than ResNet. These are the, the results we basically get on Cypher. Um, however, if you go on much deeper networks, so this is basically a small view where we see that ResNet outperforms DenseNet, and DenseNet is slightly better than GoogleNet. However, if you go for very, very, very deep networks, this is where these architectures actually become very different. Inception is not designed for being uh, in that deep of a network because you see we don't have any residual connections. This is why there were extensions like Inception ResNet. While DenseNet and ResNet are both designed for very deep networks. However, very deep networks get again quite expensive to run and there actually DenseNet has shown to be a bit better, especially when in the number of parameters you used compared to the performance you get. In our case here, ResNet performs best if you go deep, there's often a DenseNet slightly better. But this is not given, so for different tasks you might also again get different uh, scores. Therefore it's still good to know all of them. Interestingly, there's also a network that actually combine both. So there's one network called Dual Path, which uses ResNet and DenseNet combined, and this is one of the best models actually currently on Cypher. This is why then the final question, the conclusion here, we have seen now Inception, ResNet, and DenseNet. Which model should I actually use for my task? Well, that can't be so easily answered. Um, it depends on the task. Usually, ResNet is a very good option to be the first one to test. If ResNet underperforms of what you expect, then you can go, for example, for DenseNet. But there are many, many more architectures out there. So it doesn't mean that you always have to go with a standard ResNet. Often it really depends on your task. And you have to think about what your task is and what you actually need. Do you need a very deep network? Do you need inception, which could maybe look at different scales? Or do you just need one which has a lot of convolutions, like a very deep ResNet? So this is why this question can't be answered just by a simple yes or no, and is always depending on your actual task.